Good morning, everybody. There's lots of talks over the many years with conferences to do with web scale. It's a well understood problem. And there's lots of great tools out there for doing web scale, Nginx, Varnish, hip hop these days, and of course the NoSQL movement. Uh, people like Derek and MongoDB. But what I want to talk today is about data processing and how you can use PHP with fire hoses of data. And that means big data. So one of the things we can do today as we go along, a little bit of a drinking game. Every time you see a big data hashtag, you should have a drink. And <laughs> we'll see who can walk out at the end of it. <laughs> now, what is big data? Let's start with a definition of big data. So what big data really is, it's the business of society. Because the world is full of data, and data's been around for hundreds of years, from well before we had computers to process them. Now, these days when people talk about big data, they think of social, because social's leading the way on this with fire hoses and things like that. Um, but you've also got a lot of data that's currently siloed. You've got banks with all their data stores. You've got supermarkets, and places like that. And of course, you've got the Internet of Things coming along, which is going to produce data about everything. You're going to have lampposts tweeting, traffic likes tweeting, who knows what's coming in there. So the thing with big data is it's an old problem that's been rediscovered, which is the story of computing over the decades, really. Because computers have been processing data well before the web came along. I, when I started in industry, um, it was before the web was commercialized at all. And we worked on data processing apps before we started doing websites. But the last 15 years, what we've seen is language and toolkits have all evolved for the web, for publishing web pages, for interacting with customers, for doing e-commerce. And big data really is kind of putting pressure on all of that and forcing languages to change again. And at the moment, Big data is best tackled by a mix of languages. And one of the things I want to show you today is how PHP has a role to play in all of that. Because if you listen to all the hype, everyone says, big data, it's Java, it's Hadoop, or it's Python and NumPy and things like that. But PHP has a role to play as well. In fact, it's got two roles to play. And that's what this talk is all about. So let's get into what the talks we're going to cover for. And I want to explain a bit more about what a fire hose is, because chances are you've not had the chance to really play with one before. So we'll talk about that and look at that. One of the things we do with PHP is we ingest fire hoses. I'm going to show you how we do that, what the architecture is that we use to achieve that. Now, in our business, we take the fire hose, we make it smaller, and then we deliver it to our customers. And that's another area where PHP is superbly suited. So I'm going to show you how we do that and why we use PHP there. Now I mentioned earlier about a mix of languages. So we're going to show you the overall architecture and how PHP fits in around everything else. And then I'm going to pull it all together, give you a nice big set of slides to show you why we use PHP. So my inspiration for this talk is you go on uh, Hacker News, you follow certain people who I will not name on Twitter, and PHP gets a lot of bashing as being a language for amateurs. It's a language that allowed Facebook to spend, what was it, 16 billion this week on an app? And their stuff's all built on PHP. B PHP is the language of big business. It's the language of big data. And I want to show you how we do that today. There's a chat with a microphone for questions. So we'll take questions at the end of the talk um, today, if that's OK with everybody. So let's get into it. And let's start off by looking at what a fire hose is. And to help explain a fire hose, let's start off with scraping. So hands up who's ever scraped a website for content. That's almost everybody. OK. So a lot of what I'm just about to explain about scraping hopefully is going to be very familiar to all of you. So here's my definition of scraping. You've got a robot, downloads a web page, and it tries to make sense of what it's downloaded. That, in a nutshell, really is what scraping about. But let's explore that in a little bit more detail first. 
So the first thing is you've got a robot downloading a web page or a website. How does the robot know when to go and download? It's got to go on a schedule and poll the website to scrape for content. Because you're not just looking for new content, you're looking for when existing content's updated as well. And you've got to go and download it and hope you catch it in a reasonable time. Now, RSS was, you know, helped solve this problem because you could just pull the RSS feed and use that to go and get things. But with Google Reader having closed down, RSS is now starting to die out on the net. Now, before I go there, there's one more point I want to make. How many of you run your own website, blogs and things? Almost as many people. And how much of your traffic is bots scraping your website? Hardly anybody. Well, my website gets scraped by over 20 bots. It's, it's the source of 60, 70% of the traffic on my website. And I know I'm fed up of the bots all hammering the website at the same time. And imagine you're scraping someone's content. Everyone wants to scrape that content. They're right in their own scrapers. Bots have a negative effect on people's websites. It's a real pain in the backside. So that's one of the problems with using a robot to download content. But let's also look at the other part of it. You've got to make sense of the content you've downloaded. And the content you've downloaded is normally marked up HTML. If you're lucky, you can get an XML feed, which is more semantically marked up. But even today, markup just isn't used semantically. I mean, how long has the RDF movement been around? 10 years, 12 years? HTML5's got tags to help us understand the shape of a website. But how many people just use divs and classes everywhere for marking up their site? Lots of people do. Now, you're trying to extract with a scraper, you're trying to extract content from a page that's got other stuff on it. It's got navigation on it. It's probably got adverts on it. It's got tweet boxes. It's got all sorts of things that your scraper's got to go and ignore in order to find the content that you want. Now, this makes scraping fragile. So all of you who've uh, done scraping before, how many times have you had to go and fix a scraper because someone changed their website? Yep. And when it happens, it's disruptive to your work, isn't it? It takes time. You've got, to go and, you've got to go and change your bot, get it working again. And during that time, you're not able to scrape content. It's not a really nice process to work with. Now, we all know there's a, there's a great example of who's the most famous scraper of all. And that's Google. That's their business. They scrape websites and turn it into search results. And you think of Google, you think of them hiring the smartest people on the planet. They go around and they hoover them up and they, they solve really difficult problems. But when was the last time you did a search on Google and every item on the front page was relevant to your search term? My point there is even Google, with all the brain power they've got, struggle to make sense of a scraped web. And just imagine how badly the other search engines do who can't hire the quality of people Google can hire. So that's really hard work. Scraping's really hard work. And it doesn't sound like fun. So this is where fire hoses come in. So here's my definition of a fire hose. Notice how, how it's much shorter for a start. It's a live stream of events that you consume so let's break that down. It's a stream of events. It's a, it's a flow of data coming in. And they're events. It's not content. It's, it's an entity that tells you that something has happened. It tells you what has happened, whether there's been a new post, whether there's been an update. Maybe someone's gone and deleted a content or a tweet. Or maybe the user status has changed. They've gone and marked their stuff as private, for example. You're getting told what's happening. You're not having to guess. It's a great thing about a fire hose. The other thing about a fire hose is it's a live stream. It's happening now. Right now, those of you in the audience who are tweeting about that conference, that data is going into a fire hose and is being delivered to Twitter's fire hose partners right now. It takes typically less than a second for when you press send on your Twitter button for it reaching the fire hose partners to process. Real time. The other point about a fire hose is you consume it. You connect to it, and data flows. You're not going on a schedule. You're not having to remember to go back, and you've got polling with timeouts, etc., to deal with 
outages, the data's flowing and you've got to be Johnny on the spot for it because there's no respite for this data. It comes in every second of every day. There's no second chance with fire hoses. If you're connected to a fire hose and you can't keep up with the data coming through, you're going to miss that data and it's gone forever. You can't get it back with a fire hose. So you, with, when you work consuming fire hoses, you need extreme reliability and you've got to be able to scale to cope with the data. PHP is perfect for that and we're going to show you why. First of all, when I say you've got to keep up with this, here's some data from Twitter. This is on their engineering blog and it shows you what their largest peak last year. So this happened on the 3rd of August. You probably can't see from the back. But this goes from, ooh, what's that, about 15,000 a second all the way up to 143,000 tweets a second. That's 25 times increase in traffic, just like that. No warning, no one could know it was coming, no time to plan for it, it just happened. That's what fire hoses can do because they're relentless. In a typical day, according to Twitter's own public data. Over more than 500 million tweets are published via the fire hose. That's a working average of 5,700 tweets per second. All this information is on Twitter's engineering blog. This is about um, a, a show called Castle in the Sky, which was shown in Japan. Do go Google it, do go read about it. It gives you a good idea for what fire hose scale means. And this is just one of the fire hoses we have at DataSift where I work. So fire hoses feel like this. It feels like the thunder of the Niagara Falls. Constant pressure coming over and you've got to be able to keep up with it. PHP can do this. 100% of all the fire hose data that comes into our business is processed by PHP code. Every single piece of data that comes in via Firehose goes through our PHP code. So if anyone says PHP can't do X, Y, Z, we know it can because we're doing it. So how do we do that? Let's go and have a look. Let's look at first of all how we receive the Firehose because that's the first thing we do with our PHP code. So here's an architecture diagram, very simple. Now the key to this, boxes in blue, like that. I don't know if you can see the laser pointer out there. I hope you can. The boxes in blue are PHP code. The boxes in orange on this particular diagram are written in C++. And the boxes in red are data sources, they're fire hoses. So we get two types of fire hose in our, in our business typically. We get very high volume fire hoses and then we get smaller fire hoses because no, no two fire hoses are ever alike. For the really high volume fire hoses, we have a custom app in C++ called Goblin just to keep up with the flow of data coming through. It lives in, in the States in a data center very close to our upstream partners. And it's got internal store forward buffers to smooth out peaks like we saw in the earlier graph. And we use this to help us cope with the very high volume fire hoses because you can only make one or two connections to these, so you really need very tight, fast code for this, and that's where you need to move to a lower level language like C++ to achieve that. But for the lower volume fire hoses, PHP is fine. It can keep up just fine. And another reason for using PHP for this is every fire hose is unique. It's got its own unique interface to, to, to work with. And when we start working with a partner, we want to bring that fire hose on board as quickly as possible. And PHP is a highly productive language. You can get more done in PHP than in C++ in the same amount of time. So PHP is a superb language for that. It's much quicker to work with. Now together, these two ways of loading here really map onto the extract phase of ETL. How many people know what ETL is? Okay, so there's a few people done some data warehousing. So ETL is extract, transform, load. It's the process of taking data, scrubbing it, normalizing it, and putting it into a data warehouse for searching. And this maps onto the extract phase of ETL. And for those of you who've never heard of ETL, I highly recommend go and have a look at data warehousing. 
you'll find lots of architectural information that you can bring back to use to your own web apps and it will help those scale as well. It's well worth knowing about. Now, all this data comes in to our interaction assembly application. Now, what that application does is it takes the raw data upstream and restructures it into a normalized form. So we're starting to get into the transform stage here of loading data. So we take, say, a tweet or a bit.ly link, and we add our own additional information, such as when we received it, what the main content is. It just gives a normal structure to help our customers understand the data we're about to deliver to them. And then what we want to do is we want to add value to that data upstream. And again, this is where PHP is great for this. And the first thing we do is we go and look for URLs. Are there any URLs in the data? And if so, we want to go and expand those and find out what the, where the URL really goes to. So deal with any URL shorteners, find out the title of the web page, find out the meta tag, the keywords from there. We want to find those out. We want to add those to the original data. We want to add value. Because a fire hose is valuable. It's big business these days. But a fire hose plus, for lack of a better phrase, a fire hose plus augmented data really helps customers find information quicker. So we go and, we go and expand those links. And that was our original business. That was TweetMeme, which we're going to come back to in a little bit. If there's no link, we just feed it straight into another store forward buffer to be added additional data. We do things like language detection. What language is the person writing in? Someone's Twitter profile might say what language they said is their native language, but you, you go through tweets, there's people use different languages all the time. So you've got to look on it on a case-by-case -case basis. Gender detection. You know, who is the person who's tweeting? Are they male, are they female? Do they consider themselves one of the alternatives? What's the sentiment of the, of, the, of the information they've just sent? Are they happy? Are they sad? You know, they're saying PHP UK is great. They're saying the coffee downstairs was wonderful. Things like that are very useful. We go and try and extract topics. We try and make sense of this. Um, this is based on a Wikipedia database. And we try and go, right, you know, are they tweeting about conferences? Are they teaching about, treat, uh, tweeting about programming languages? That sort of thing as well. We're enhancing the original data. And we're doing all of this using PHP. And these are, all, these are all HTTP request reply services with a lot of caching in the way. Because we've got real-time products, so we've got to make things really, really quick. And then finally, at the very end, we dispatch the data out to our various pipelines for further processing once we've built the data. So this is our transform stage. So we've got extraction, we've got transformation, and this is all done using PHP. Every piece of data goes through this, done using PHP. So what's our PHP apps look like, which I imagine is the real thing you want to hear from me. So let's go into our architecture. And internally, we have a pattern, a design pattern, if you like, that we call the job queue. Now, first thing to say about this is all our code runs on Linux. It doesn't run on Windows at all. So things like Supervisor D, those are Linux-specific tools. And they're really handy for this. So first of all, the supervisor D's job is to make sure our process is running at all. So it fires off a manager process. It's a single Unix process. Its job is to load the config for that particular application off disk. Our configs are just a straightforward JSON file. We, there's no XML. There's no containers, no service discovery of any kind. It's just straight loaded up. Our configs are managed by Chef. We do all our deployments in production via Chef. So the app ships the code. Our ops team build the config in Chef, writes it to disk as a JSON file that the manager loads. Now, the manager starts a pool of workers. This is a bit like PHP FPM, you could argue. It knows how many workers should run for that app, and it, knows, and it keeps an eye on them as well. So if any of them stop working for any reason, it knows to kill it off and restart it. So there's a Keep Alive service going along here, which is something we've built into the app. And this is very important, because if you're processing data in real time, and for some reason one of your, you've got a bad loop in your code, for example, and your app stops responding, you've got to be there straight away to kill it and restart it. You've got to have these mechanisms automated. And we do that. We manage all that through PHP. The other thing the manager knows to do, and the other reason you need a manager, is we need to be able to shut down these workers 
we want to do a code upgrade, because these workers run for a long time. It's not like a, a web request where your script runs, you serve the data back to the customer, and the script shuts down. These are long-running jobs. These can run for weeks, months at a time, depending on how many releases we're doing. So the manager needs to keep an eye on this and go, that stopped working, need to restart it. And when it's time for an upgrade, it needs to go, let's shut it down so all the buffers with all the data in are drained first. So there's no data in memory when we shut the process down. Because that causes data loss. And we don't want any data loss at all. Now, the workers, they're part of a pipeline. They're taking data from somewhere upstream. They don't care what it is. It's just a ZMQ socket for them. They read the data in. They perform their activity, their task. And they write whatever the data is they've transformed back out to whatever's next in the pipeline. They don't know what's in, van in front. They don't know what's behind. They don't need to know. All these components are isolated. It means we've got a very flexible architecture. We can easily change the shape of our architecture. We can add new processing. We can slim things down, even if needed, without affecting anything else in the pipeline. Now, pipeline architectures have been around for decades. The most famous example is Unix System 5 streams. Anyone here worked on System 5 back in the day? No? Nope. So the guys at Bell Labs came at and They were looking at a new way to do device drivers. And a device driver back then, before you had um, like, you know, uh, frame buffers and all the stuff with modern GPUs, they were basically data processing devices. You sent data to them, they did something with it, and the device would also send data back, for example, when you move a mouse. So the AT&T guys were looking at how to solve this, and they decided to build their device drivers as a net of pipelines. Now, this was back in the 80s. Um, Dennis Ritchie. Um, the R in K and R for ANSI C, for anyone who programs in C. He's credited as one of the lead authors on this. And they built all this stuff. They built a whole operating system that worked on this. And the reason you've not heard of System 5 is it was too slow back then. You didn't have the computing power you've got today to do the architecture. But today, computing power is so readily available, um, especially last week when Intel finally announced the new 15-core Xeon processors. You can do so much with hardware today that makes these patterns from the 70s and the 80s reusable now. And any time you're looking to solve a problem, first thing you should do is go back to the 70s and 80s and see whether or not someone had already solved it then. Chances are they did, and it's just a, a pattern waiting for its time. And pipelines is one of those. Now, this whole process is very simple, very lightweight. In fact, I'll give you a tip if you're ever interested in joining Datasoft. Um, this is one of our interview questions. We ask people to come in, we ask them to write a lot of code so we can see that they can code. So I'm giving you a little bit of a heads up here. So everyone who hasn't come to this talk, you have a little advantage over them if you ever want to work for us. Is we actually ask people to actually create their version of this framework from scratch and see how they would solve it. OK? That's what we do. Right. So that's how we receive data and how our apps are structured to achieve that. The end thing we do is we deliver the hose once we've filtered it. I'm not going to talk about how we filter the hose here, because we don't use any PHP for that. We use C++. We need extreme performance, so extreme, in fact, that we're actually looking to port our code to run on GPUs to get even more parallelism. And we also need really, really good Unicode handling. And Unicode is an unfinished story with PHP, I think it's fair to say. There's still work to be done there to get PHP really good at Unicode. So for, for now, for processing, PHP is not used for that. But once we've, once we've taken that data and we've filtered it to isolate the data that our customers want, we need to deliver it to our customers. And that's the second area where we use PHP. And we call this the filtered hose. So it's smaller than a fire hose but there's thousands of them in parallel. So they all add up together. And I'll show you some numbers in a little bit to show you just how much they add up. And here's our architecture for how we use PHP for that. So once again, same scheme. Blue boxes are PHP. Orange boxes are something else. In this case, a mixture of C++ and JVM languages, some Java and some Scala as well. Um, now, the first thing we do is data from the filtered hose comes in to our security mechanism, which is our access controller, which makes sure the customer's authorized to receive the data that has been selected for them. 
and then we put it via our push producer into Kafka. Anyone here use Kafka? A few people? So Kafka is another store and forward buffer, but it allows you to have thousands of separate buffers in parallel on disk. It's written in Java. It's an Apache project, I believe. And it's very, very good at doing this. So we store all this data into Kafka. Now, we then need to find, you know, a new stream comes along for a customer. We need to find it. So we've got an app called Push Scheduler written in PHP that says, OK, tell me what new streams there are. It discovers the new streams to be delivered. It manages a pool of workers. So again, we've got the manager and the worker pattern repeated here. This is, this is another example of it being used. The workers' jobs, they take the data from Kafka. So they, they're, they're told to deliver one stream. They go and get that stream of data for that customer. So they're reading it from Kafka. And then they go and connect to customer servers. They log into customer systems and put the data directly into the customer's database, into their applications. And this is something PHP is superbly good at. And when I say we log into customers' applications, we're delivering data to places like Google BigQuery, CouchDB, Amazon's DynamoDB, Elasticsearch. We've got FTP support. We can post it via HTTP. We've got MongoDB support to keep Derek happy. MySQL. We support Postgres as well. Redis. Redis is really good. Redis is a great thing to go to when you've got any sort of queuing problem to solve. Really recommend Redis. We can deliver data into Amazon S3 buckets. We support various mechanisms for Splunk, which is an enterprise log tool, which is starting to branch out into other things. And something called Zoom Data, which I have to be honest and say I don't know what it is, but it is on our website. <laughs> but I've never used it myself, so I don't know what it is. And not, some customers, are, you know, they've got a firewall, and they're not going to open firewall ports for us to inject data into their apps. So we also have a, a, a pull mechanism as well, where they can connect to, to our PHP code and say, right, give me the last 50, pull that down, and then connect again, give me the last 50, for example, as well, and pull that down as well. And the whole point here is we're using PHP to make it as easy as possible for customers to use our apps. We can link this back to Joe's keynote this morning, where he was saying about overcoming barriers. So receiving a fire hose is difficult. It requires very reliable code, very, very fast code. A filtered hose is smaller than a fire hose, but for a customer, it's probably still the biggest stream of data they've ever seen. And they probably don't have those in-house skills to do that, especially as their use of the streams grow and they start to get more and more data. So what we've done here is we've reached out to our customers and learned how to put data into their systems so the data is just there. They just, as far as they're concerned, the data just appears in MySQL. They don't need to worry about how it gets there. It makes life easy for customers. And PHP is a key part of achieving this. So this part of the architecture is the load part of ETL. Only we're not loading it into our own databases. We're loading it into our customers. But it's still the same pattern, ETL, data warehousing. Definitely go learn it. Now, some numbers. We are delivering across all our customers more than one fire hose of data. So every second, we've, this is the amount of data that's going out to our customers via this, via this code, via this PHP code. Every single second, we're delivering more than one fire hose. And it's all, this mechanism is all going through our PHP code for this. And again, we're talking performance, we're talking reliability, and we're also talking connectivity as well. One of the reasons. One of the reasons we use PHP for this is because it can talk to just about everything that matters, and quite a lot of niche stuff as well. It's superb for that. If you're using another language, you get the core language, then you've got to go find all the different drivers and libraries for it, and you've got to download those, you've got to track changes for those. It's a lot of work. With PHP, you can just use the extensions that ship with PHP, and you can talk to most things. So it really is superb for that. Another number. Our peak for delivering to customers is more than two fire hoses at a time, the equivalent of that. And again, we're doing that with PHP. We just scale up. It's not a problem at all. And that architecture I showed you earlier, it scales because it's a share-nothing architecture. There's no databases in there. We've got a queue, we've got, all we've got is store forward buffers. 
They don't care who's reading the data. They don't even care who's writing the data. They're just there to accept the data, store it until our PHP code's ready to pull it off and deliver it. No databases, no application servers, nothing that other communities take for granted in their design patterns. None of that. PHP mentality is to do away with all that guff and just go down to the bare essentials. It's really good for that. Now, I have another reason for doing this talk. And that's how I want to inspire people here. Our engineering team is British. It's based here in Britain. It was founded in Britain. We're now a multinational company. But you don't have to go to the valley to do this kind of engineering. And you don't have to use trendy languages to do this kind of engineering. We're a British engineering company taking advantage of American finance, American business know-how, and multiple international nationalities, sorry, from around the planet. Last count, I think we've got over, we must be approaching now a dozen different nationalities in the company. But you can do this here in the UK. It can be done. Our founder, Nick Halstead, was on CNBC this week and um, being interviewed because one of the things he's announced is that before the end of the decade, we're hoping to do a billion dollar flotation. That's a big, tech success story for the UK. It can be done here in the UK. So, let's look at where PHP fits in with everything else. This is our architecture diagram. It'll be easier to read when you download the slides later after the talk, but I'll talk you through some of the key points of it. So, what I've highlighted here are the parts of our architecture that I've already talked about in my talk. Hopefully you can see the laser pointer. So this is the extract and transform stages up here. Store forward buffers, PHP code. And this box here is our old business, TweetMeme. It's now one box on this architecture diagram. That's how much we've grown for to be able to process fire hoses. Down here, is our delivery mechanism, where we've got the scheduler discovering our streams to deliver out to all of our customers via the different mechanisms. So these, perp these pink boxes, they look pink on the download of slides, I promise. They are where our PHP code is inside our data processing pipeline. As you can see, those are two reasonably sized boxes on a much larger diagram. We also have service-oriented architecture as well. Um, you're all missing the service architecture talk in order to come see me, so thank you very much. And what we have here is lots of... Where's my pointer gone? Ah, I think the battery's just died. Right, so what we've got here is lots of simple request-reply services that support the main pipeline applications. Hit them with a request, they give a response out. PHP's superb for that. I mean, that's the, hit, that's the story of the web. And there's no reason to use a different language for that. PHP's really, really good at that. Now, our architecture does a lot more. I've mentioned pipelines, so I want, to, I want to put where we use PHP in context and show you what our different pipelines are. So here's our ingestion again, and I've added in some non-firehose data we get as well. Not everything's a firehose, even we have to scrape at the minute, which is why we all hate it so much, because we've been doing it. And from there, what we have is a real-time pipeline where we're processing the data as it's coming in and delivering to customers within that one second out to our customers. So that's through people like Twitter's infrastructure, across the Atlantic to us, through our infrastructure, minimum of nine hops, out to customers who are often back over the other side of the world, back over the Atlantic. And we do all of that in about a second. Now we can't do that with pure PHP. PHP is not built for extreme speed like that. We have to use a lot of C++ to achieve that. So this box in the middle, come on, there we go. So this box in the middle here, this is all C++ code. This is our filtering engine. And I believe we're running that on about 40 boxes at the minute in parallel in order to keep up with the data. So this knows, this, this knows what a customer wants and it filters the data to only pass through the data that matches the customer's filters. There's a, there's a phrase in big data. It's not information overload, it's filter failure. 
Filtering is how you take big data and find the bits that matter to you and make sense to you. And we have to use C++ for that for the performance. Now, we also have a historics product. And this is where Hadoop comes in. So Hadoop and big data are like joined at the hip anytime anyone talks about it. And yes, we use Hadoop. Um, we've got a HDFS 160, 200 machine, something like that. I've lost track. All storing petabytes of data, social data going back to January 2010. And this is our historics product where people can come and search for things that have happened in the past. So that's using a mix of Java and other JVM languages. And we've got the same C++ processing engine embedded in the Java via JNI, the Java native interface. So we've got the same filtering engine in both pipelines to make sure the filters work exactly the same everywhere. But that comes back down to our PHP system for delivery. So none of the data can escape our PHP code. We don't work around PHP. It's, it's at the heart of what we do. It's superb for it. So let's summarize why we use PHP. And hopefully these are good examples that you can take back to your firms if anyone's ever pressuring, pressuring you to move away from PHP to other languages. Um, if you want to post this for the internet trolls, feel free. Um, I, I'm personally, the ability, um, personally of the opinion you shouldn't feed the trolls. But if you want to, hopefully this will help. We need to acknowledge that we use PHP, first of all, because of our history. PHP was a language we knew before. DataSift grew out of a business called TweetMeme, which is the, the retweet button. Um, our founder, Nick House, that invented that um, and then let Twitter have it. Before that, he was doing an RSS reader called Favorite, which is where Nick learned to love Zen Framework so much. Not. Before launch, it was either the first or the second programming language of every engineer on the team. People, we have some great Python programmers, some great Java programmers, but the one language that everybody knew was PHP. It's a universal language. It's so widely used. These days in university, it's quite rare to find a graduate who hasn't done a PHP project during their course. Sure, they've done Java as well. They've probably done Python these days. But just about every comp sci graduate will have done PHP at some point. Even if it's only WordPress for their own website, they will have used PHP. We already knew how to optimize and scale PHP. For us, PHP was no risk. We knew what we were doing. We knew how it behaved. We knew what we had to do to make it fast. For us, using a different language, which may or may not have been better, would have been a bad choice because we'd have had to learn all these things again. With PHP, we had the experience. And as I mentioned at the start, when it comes to web scale, the information's out there. There's books, there's talks, there's conferences like this. It's a solved problem for how to scale PHP. It's nothing new. And this is something I really want to emphasize, is how well PHP works. It's easy to take PHP for granted because it works so well until you switch to alternatives. And then you start to appreciate what PH, just how well PHP works. It doesn't crash. It doesn't seg fault. It really doesn't leak memory that much. It doesn't have unpredictable garbage collection. These are things that other languages, and I'm not going to name any names here, um, these are things that other languages, these are tests other languages cannot pass, where PHP does. Now, this has a nice benefit. It's so important, this, especially as you're scaling your, your, your server farm. I mentioned we've got hundreds of servers. Our ops team, if they're woken up in the middle of the night, it's not because PHP crashed. Sure, we may write bad PHP code. Um, that's our fault. That's not the language's fault. Never the language's fault. But we don't get random crashes with PHP, whereas we do with some of the alternatives. And keeping your ops team happy is very, very important, especially if you've got a deadline to hit and you want them to do a release. And they're going, well, we had a crash with that last night. You need to do some extra testing first. It's not very good for your deadline. Now, Node.js also deserves a mention here because it's another engine that comes close to this level of reliability we've found. I think our uptime for one of our Node apps is several months, last time I checked, which is very impressive. Firehoses are unstructured data. PHP 
handles and structured data better than just about any other language we've come across so far. JSON decode. You feed it a JSON encoded string, out pops an object tree. No schemas. You don't have to know what's in there. As long as it's valid JSON, it decodes. JSON decoders for other languages are often demanding of schemas before they'll decode, because they want to create types objects. With PHP, we've got a generic object called standard class. And JSON decode just produces a tree like that. It's fantastic for the type of data we're working with. For working with fire hoses, it makes life a lot easier. See, we don't need types objects for big data. They don't actually matter because the data itself doesn't have behavior. It's the processes of the data that have behavior. So you don't need to co-locate data and code all in one object when you're processing the data. You don't need to do it. And this has really helped us scale because everything's lean, it's simple, it's very straightforward. It allows us to take on new data sources relatively quickly. And, that's, and for us as a business, that's the game we're in. Taking on data sources, getting them out into the hands of customers as quickly as possible helps us scale our business. So PHP isn't just good for our technology, it's good for business as well for us. Let's talk about string handling in PHP because this is something else that's easy to overlook um, when you're dealing with PHP and Unicode data. PHP treats strings as a block of binary data. Only when you look inside the string do you need to know whether it's UTF-8, UTF-16, anything like that. But if you're just copying data from one part of an object to another, which is what a transform stage is, PHP just copies the whole block. It doesn't care what's inside there. So we don't have to care about Unicode. So we can take all the UTF-8 encoded data that comes in. Lots of people tweet in non-Latin languages, non-Latin scripts. And we get data from other sources as well, uh, East Asian scripts. So that's UTF-8 encoded with UTF-16 surrogate pairs. That's the standard for JSON encoding. Well, as I say, we don't look inside the data for PHP. We use C++ for that because of the performance we require. So PHP in its current state of Unicode doesn't matter for us. We've worked around that, you could say. We use C++ or we use the JVM if we need to look inside because they're more mature in their handling of this at this point in time. So we are keeping an eye on PHP 6 to see what happens there. Now, the other reason we use PHP is connectivity. As I just mentioned earlier, we're connecting out to lots of customers, lots of customer systems, and PHP gives us all that for free. So the stuff that's bundled with PHP, all the extensions that are bundled, works really, really well. We have our own in-house builds of PHP. We have no patches for any of the bundled extensions with PHP. We don't patch a single one of them. And we're stressing them quite hard. And we don't patch any of them. Now, this greatly contributes to the liability in, produ in production. The last thing we want to do is have to be re-delivering fire hoses of data. That's not fun. You don't want to be doing that. You want to deliver to the customer and move on. And with PHP, we just do it. Sure, we sometimes have bugs in our own code. Every developer does. But the PHP stuff itself doesn't cause us problems. Now, when I was putting this talk together, I had a look at all the additional extensions that we find off the net and we put into our PHP build. And I hadn't actually realized this until I did this talk. We end up patching every single one of those that isn't included with PHP. So the, the quality threshold for bundled extensions in PHP is much higher than we realized. And it's easy to take it for granted because it just works. And we could speculate as to why that is. Maybe it's because PHP is so widely used. When an when a extension is first added, the bugs get found and fixed relatively quickly. But the net result is if it's with PHP, it's really good. If it's third party, not so good at the minute. And I mentioned earlier about philosophy, about the share nothing architecture. Because we've got so many people who've done projects with PHP, they bring that mentality to the problems we ask them to solve. And share nothing is so important for scaling, it really is. So let's very quickly run through a summary of my slides. I explained what a fire hose is. It's a live stream of events that you consume. I showed you the architecture for how we receive fire hoses and what we use for PHP, which parts of it are done via PHP. 
I looked at how we delivered our filtered hoses and the role PHP plays in that and the vital role it plays with the connectivity in particular. We looked at the PHP job queue pattern, which is what we use for our PHP applications because they're not running behind Nginx, they're standalone programs that run for a long period of time. I showed you PHP in the context of our entire DataSift architecture. And if you're interested in knowing more about architecture, I'll be downstairs in the coffee bar after this talk if you want to come and look at this in more detail and learn more about it. I talked about we use PHP because of our history, because of how reliable it is. It's very good handling of unstructured data and binary strings, because binary strings are the default behavior in PHP. It talks to everything. We need to connect to a customer system, chances are PHP can already do it. And the share nothing design philosophy is very pragmatic for scaling. And that's PHP at the Firehose scale. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, there's one down here. You'll have to excuse me, the lights are a bit blinding. Hello. Hello. Um, you mentioned a custom build of PHP. Yes. Um, do you use HHVM with your custom build, or do you just patch um, the core project? At the minute, we're, we're using patched PHP 5.3. 5.5, we were able to crash it for quite a while. So we're still in the process of migrating to 5.5. We don't use Hip Hop Virtual Machine because it doesn't yet have all the extensions that we rely on for PHP. Sorry, in that case, um, what's the most heavily modified portion of the PHP core? Of the core, I don't think we really patch the core, to be honest. It's more, it's more patching third-party extensions when they seg fault or they have integer overflows internally or they need patching because they were built against an older version of the Zend API and they're not using the macros correctly for compiling. It's things like that. So it's bug fixes rather it's than... It's bug fixes, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? One down here. You mentioned earlier a Node.js. Yes. Are you using this for processing or for web access on your application? We're using it for web access, for HTTP streaming. So we support web sockets for streaming data down to customers so that over the same connection they can change what data they want to receive. Web sockets is a great protocol for this. Node.js was first with really good web socket support. Um, I have written a PHP extension to do this, but I've never released it. So at the minute, Node.js is the best game in town, in our opinion, for this. Next question. No, nope, lots of stunned silence. Hopefully, oh, there's one more. Um, sorry, WebSockets. Yes. Have, have you tried the uh, socket server from the React framework? No, we haven't. Um, I imagine, though, it's written in pure PHP? Yeah. Yeah, it won't be fast enough. You can't pass, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Autobahn tests for WebSocket compliance? Okay, so there's a project called Autobahn which release a, re uh, release a compliance test which they keep up to date as the WebSocket spec changes. Um, you can't pass that with pure PHP. PHP is too slow to do the UTF-8 processing that's required for that. That's one of the reasons I had to write a custom extension for it. Um, because if someone sends you invalid UTF-8, for example, um, you have to reject the data packet. And that's a time critical operation in their tests. And that's best done in C. Especially as UTF 8 characters can be split across web frames. Because um, the WebSocket protocol is frame based. You get a block of data, and you have to combine those and move across them. OK. Any more questions? One down here for me, Ian. Oh, by the way, if you want to know about doing stuff in the 70s and 80s, this is something Ian was talking about years before I've mentioned it. You should definitely go grab a, buy Ian a drink and get him to talk about it. With, um, with this kind of architecture and with the fire hose where yep. you're sending data constantly and you, you can't miss any, how do you approach testing that? How do you approach quality before you okay. push that code into production? So the first thing I did when I joined DataSift was I built a firehose simulator called Hornet, because it's an evil test tool. And it can simulate, it can generate data sets for firehoses, and it can simulate volumes of, of firehoses, because the firehose is the unit of measure we use for this. 
And pre-launch, we, sh we kicked off all our pre-launch customers, shut the whole platform down for a week. I had the whole data center to myself. And we took it up to 10 fire hoses simultaneously. This is back in October 2011. So just over two and a half years ago now, I guess. And at that point, what we found was it was the network that melted first. The data centers, network switches, couldn't cope with that, that amount of bandwidth going through their backplanes. And if you go on the DataSift engineering blog, Gar I think that's where Gareth put it. Gareth put a blog out there about what we had to do, what switches we had to buy in order to upgrade the network so it could cope with that volume of data. This is a very good resource. Go, go, go find it. It's just worth noting that Hornet's also listening in PHP. Yes. Yeah, so when I joined, um, they, was, they were trying to reuse their off-the-shelf Java tools and also a tool called Bees with Machine Guns, which I think is written in Ruby. I've not used it for a long time. Um, these, all, these all run on, a, they run them from AWS, and they're having trouble simulating the loads required. So with PHP, as long as you're not manipulating data, you can generate data and push it out the door. You can saturate a network link, no problem at all. And because Hornet's a shared nothing architecture, you can just run loads of copies in parallel. I mean, what do we run, 100, 200 in, in parallel, something like that, in order to really stress test our application. Now, post-launch, of course, we can't shut the whole platform down to do this. So what we've done is we've built a replica that simulates our bottlenecks, and we do our testing against that first. And we know how to scale those results up to production. So we know what load we can get on our simulated environment, how that will translate to production so we know whether something's safe to go out the door or not. And so Hornet's still in daily use today, two and a half years after it was invented. It's, a, it's an evil test tool. Um, it, its user agent is Hornet666 as the version number. So it always gets a good chuckle out of uh, our developers. When we bring someone new on and they're, they're wondering what's hammering the crap out of their application while they're shipping for the first time when they've joined us, they go and look in the headers and it normally makes for a good conversation. <laughs> Any more questions? No. Nope. Well, if, if you do have any more, if you want to learn more about the architecture, I'll be downstairs getting a nice cup of coffee. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>